We know about diabetes type one. We know about diabetes type two. What's this diabetes 1.5? Find out today on Medical History Mystery. So tell me, there's this new diabetes type out there, type 1.5. What is it? So if you went to school right around the same time, I went to school, or even a little after, you know, you knew that there were basically two types of diabetes, right? Type 1 diabetes, which at the time we called juvenile onset diabetes, uh, you know, insulin dependent diabetes. And type 2 diabetes was, you know, fit nicely in its little mold of okay, it's not juvenile onset, it's adult onset, and it's not insulin dependent, it's non-insulin dependent. And everything was neat in its little box. And then everything got blurry because then we started to see that you could get type 1 diabetes later in life. And we started to see you can get type 2 diabetes earlier in life. And then we just also noticed that patients who are, have type 2 diabetes, as they lived longer, thanks to great strides we made in treating the disease, ended up becoming insulin dependent anyway. So then the idea forms that maybe they're not so distinct. Maybe there's this third type of diabetes, some people call type 1.5, which is latent autoimmune diabetes in adults or LADA. And the reason why that's so important is because type 1 diabetes, and I, I don't even know why we call it type 1 diabetes. It's really not diabetes. At the end of the day, type 1 diabetes really is an autoimmune disorder. So if we looked at type 1 diabetes as an autoimmune disorder, this is a type of that same autoimmune disorder, but it occurs later in life. It may not be type 1 that you just got later. It might be a different kind of diabetes that doesn't quite fit the mold of type 1, doesn't quite fit the mold of type 2. It's somewhere in the middle, but it is later on adult onset and not so much in, in kids. So the, the reason why this comes up is because we're worried that a lot of people that we look at, oh, okay, you're over the age of uh, 40 uh, or 30, there's, there's the new marker. Uh, you've got this type of diabetes. Ah, it's probably type two. So let's get started. It's probably insulin resistance and we're going to get you on metformin and we're going to, you know, get you on a, a proper diet and do some exercise and you know, we'll start you if metformin doesn't work, we'll move on to some of the other drugs like the SGLT2 inhibitors. And we go way down this road thinking it's type 2 diabetes, but it's really this type one and a half. And so So how do they identify that somebody has type one and a half? Do they just not respond to conventional therapies or do they have a different, say, classification? You know how yeah. not that we should generalize because we don't want to generalize here on medical history mysteries, but that you could kind of generalize type two diabetes, even though there's people that fall out of that. What's the characteristics of somebody who has 1.5? So that's the thing, okay? You, you you fit all of the, you know, box criteria. You're older, you have this diabetes, your A1C is high, your fasting blood glucose is high. Okay, you got type two. And we start treating you with medications designed to treat type two, and you don't do so well. You don't do well on metformin. You don't do well on the, the gliflozins, the, the SGLT2 inhibitors like Jardians. You don't do so well even on Ozempic. And, and we're struggling saying, why? Why aren't you responding? But think about it. If it's late onset type 1 type diabetes, they wouldn't respond very well because that's an autoimmune destruction of the cells that make insulin. So using the standard medications you use to treat type 2, won't work really well or won't work well for, you know, they'll only work well for a short period of time. So, okay, that starts thinking about, start us thinking about how do you diagnose it? Okay, so we know type one diabetes is positive for autoantibodies, right? All you gotta do is check for the autoantibodies, you know the patient's got type one, okay. You also have very low C-peptide levels. I mean, that's key, that's one of the, the markers, okay? That's type one. Now type two is usually negative for those autoantibodies, because it's not an autoimmune process, okay? And you have normal C-peptide levels. And then this type 1.5, this LADA, is a little bit of both. You're positive for the autoantibodies, 
but you don't have very low C peptide levels, just slightly low C peptide levels. And so all that means to us now is we've got to consider this other type of diabetes that is adult onset, but it still may be type one, still may end up becoming adult uh, onset and insulin dependent. But here's where it really gets confusing. I have type one and a half. I'm in my 50s. I become insulin dependent. This person has type two diabetes and got diagnosed earlier in life. And now because it's been so aggressive, they also end up as insulin dependent. But type two diabetes will still work for that person to some extent. Type two medications won't work for me as much if I'm down the road with this type one and a half. So this is hard for us as dental professionals, because if this is, it's pretty new. And so it sounds like our medical colleagues need to kind of work out an individualized plan for each patient, if you would, because it sounds like the interventions are going to be different for different people. So I guess it all starts with, right, HbA1c screening, and then they're going to end up going down this path of not being responsive to traditional therapies, and then they might get classified as diabetes type 1.5. And so for us as dental professionals, we have to almost be patient that it might take a while for this patient to even get a proper diagnosis, find whatever intervention it is that's going to help get them healthy. But then in the meantime, we're working hard to reduce or eliminate inflammation in their mouth, or if they are on the docket to get an implant, we might end up having to postpone some dental therapies until they can get their diabetes figured out. And that's the thing, Pam, you know, this is a window to the rest of the body. And this person may be misdiagnosed as type two. They're trying everything. They're taking the medications the way they should. They've made the lifestyle modifications. They exercise, they eat right. And still you're seeing what appears to be, you know, okay, it looks to me like you're not well controlled. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to. So here's where a dental professional makes a difference in a patient's life by bringing up the specter of, hey, I was listening to that idiot Viola and he told me that there's new type of diabetes out there. You should probably talk to your doctor about this. Maybe this is you since you're not doing so well on the medications and, and the lifestyle modifications that we normally recommend for type two diabetics. And like that, you make a change in that patient's life that they all, uh, otherwise would not have had made for them earlier, more likely later, and you change their life forever and you you improve their quality of life. Because now I can treat them the right way. I can treat them with insulin, CGM, continuous glucose monitoring. I can, I can do the things I'm supposed to do because this is now more type one than it is type two. But it takes the trained eye of a dental professional to look at the mouth, look at the symptoms and say, okay, I see what you're saying, but what I'm seeing doesn't match. Let's get you back with your doc and let's see if we can't do something better for you. This is you and me talking, and this is all the all our friends out there listening. We're all in the medical professions. But if you're, you know, a construction worker, an accountant, this is the kind of stuff you don't think about. You have no idea and you feel lost. But imagine a dental professional who, who just makes a, it, it takes 15 seconds to have that quick conversation. I know I've often said this, you know, people say, ah, nobody listens to me. But they do because it gnaws at them. Like, why would you say something? You don't have any skin in this game. Why do you care if my diabetes is where, where it should be? And that propels them to go seek treatment. And that's all that matters. It's so true. I've said it before. I'll say it again. We have such a profound opportunity to change lives. And it all starts, right, with the medical history. So thank you for sharing information about this. I think this is going to be new information for many people out there. Absolutely. We save lives every day, Pam, because we save people from themselves. That's true. It's a great day to have a great day, and it's a great day to save lives. Absolutely. So everybody, thanks for joining us this week for Medical History Mysteries. We will see you next week. Take care, everybody. Mm -hmm.